Welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. Today, my guest is Herr Professor Dr. Mark Bauerlein, or uh, Mark, as he's agreed to be on the show today. A professor emeritus at Emory University, author of The Dumbest Generation and The Dumbest Generation Grows Up. He's also the regular host of the First Things podcast. I had the privilege of meeting Mark at the National Conservatism Conference in Miami last week, and I'm delighted to get to carry on that conversation today. Mark, welcome to the Optimistic Curmudgeon. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you. You know, I made a mistake in the title of the second book, "The Dumbest Generation Grows Up." I forgot the uh, I forgot the the quotes. The dumbest generation grows up. Oh, well, that 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 that's perhaps very that's very appropriate. That uh, they're adding scare quotes is now a a seemingly a social necessity for plenty of folks. Uh, I know I. I went to Hillsdale College for undergrad, and we had a running joke. The uh, campus newspaper, the Collegian, every year they would publish an article about the smartest class ever was coming to Hillsdale College, because every year the SAT, ACT scores would be higher. The average GPA required would uh, go up. But it seems like your books are making an opposite claim, uh, that in fact people are getting dumber over time. Is that is that accurate? Well, Josh, remember, Hillsdale, you guys, you're not representative. That's true. You're atypical. The curriculum at Hillsdale makes you guys read and read serious, great books. And actually, you should you should feel very good about someone like me uh, raising the numbers of the dumbest generation because the silver lining is the worse your peers are, the better you look. Your 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 teacher, your bosses are going to love you when they see so many of your peers uh, strolling into the office at, at 930 in the morning, you know, with, uh, you know, the, the, this in, in front of their eyes. And, and then, then wanting to talk to colleagues about what happened the night before. And uh, uh, the 50 the year olds in the office saying, I can't wait until retirement. So uh, uh, the numbers are very clear on intellectual habits, the intellectual habits generally of young people. Reading has been going down for decades. I mean, leisure reading, you know, voluntary reading in, in leisure time, not for work, not for school. In fact, on average, overall, homework assigned reading homework assigned has gone up. That doesn't mean they do all the assignments, but the schools try, have tried to push uh, more reading. And, and you know, with, with, with that big report in 1983, the No Child Left, or not, not No Child, Child Left Behind, A Nation at Risk, mm, okay. uh, which looked at uh, plummeting standards and performance in the schools, the accountability movement really got going and that led to all the testing that led to No Child Left Behind Act, which was focused on reading and math and then testing every two years uh, students on reading and math. And we've got a lot of federal data that has built up over the decades by uh, the U.S. Department of Ed. And the, the trend lines are, are very poor. Hmm. Uh, one, we have great inflation. You know, I mean, in college, it's really gotten bad. Uh, when, you know, in 1960, the most common grade was a C in college classes. You know what I'm going to say now? The most common grade in college classes now is an A, A or A minus range. Now, kids didn't get smarter. And the swelling population, of course, suggests that hmm. the grades probably should have gone down. But the great inflation, you know, set in, and that's all a long story about the decay of teacher and professor authority, uh, the, uh, the, just the, the, the shift in respect for objective measures of learning, and the, the, the sentimentalization of the student which really focused on not the student's work, 
but the student's life, the student's prospects, the student's career, especially as grad schools became more competitive. So uh, those measures look like things are getting better. Uh, they're not. More, more young people getting college degrees. That sounds like it's the smart. I mean, when the Jumas generation came out in 2008, I gave a lot of lectures and interviews and people said, no, no, the millennials are the smartest generation. More of them have college degrees than mm -hmm. any other generation in history. I said, well, that's, that's for sure. But, you know, maybe you don't, don't pay close attention to really what actually happens in college. But there was a book that came out called Academically Adrift about 10 years ago that compared test scores on a particular assessment of problem solving and critical thinking called the collegiate learning assessment from freshman year to senior year, very little gain students mm. made. In some schools, you actually had negative learning. Their capacities for critical thinking and problem solving, their scores went down during those, those four years in, in college. So, sorry. Don't buy the argument. Nope, college degree doesn't mean you're smarter, not anymore. Uh, now the reading scores, if we look just in the last 10 years, for instance, the SAT and ACT scores have fallen. Uh, you know, you've probably heard NAEP scores, uh, what's been happening there. NAEP scores in reading, have pretty much been flat for 12th graders overall mm -hmm. in, in the last four, 50 years, uh, roughly in spite of the billions of dollars that have been poured into reading instruction. And the reason why it failed isn't so much the schools, the curriculum, yes, the, there are problems there, but uh, in fact, according to NAEP data, a greater determinant of reading achievement is not the amount of homework reading you do, but the amount of leisure reading that mm. you do. And what happened from roughly the 80s up to today, the number of minutes young people spend with a book reading has plummeted. And we're not going to consider web surfing reading. We're not going to consider reading text messages, reading. We're not going to consider Twitter reading. No, what we're talking about here is long form reading, focused attention, because that's the important reading. That actually is qualitatively different from skimming, real reading. Uh, and I used to be a guy who thought, oh, it's got to be great, great books. It's got to be classics. No, no. Voluminous reading of genre fiction, you know, detective, adventure stories, romance novels. I don't care. You know, we, we should worry about those distinctions of quality of book uh, once we have uh, the demon of video games and social media and screens, you know, out of the picture. Then, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like Christians, you know, Protestants and, and Catholics uh, arguing with, with one another. When you've got a secular society mm -hmm. out to kill both of you, you know, let's just, you know, leave those, those, those uh, uh, quarrels. Find a lot more common ground there for sure. I'm, for I want to get a follow up on that. Um, I don't know if you can see the uh, shelf behind me, but this shelf uh, is my sci fi fantasy shelf, and uh, over here is my uh, hard literature shelf. Um, both I think are important, but I at least will anecdotally confirm what you're describing because as a kid, uh, I did not love serious books. I loved going to the library. Um, I went through a Bruce Covile phase, he did like YA sci fi. Uh, my parents were very much against Goosebumps and uh, R.J. Snell. That was not okay. But I was just a, I would grab anything that had that sci-fi fantasy sticker at the library. And something happened when I was in my mid-20s. It was a combination of having to teach literature for the first time, but then also kind of finally getting frustrated with the repeated tropes inside my favorite genres. I sort of morphed into this slightly more discerning reader who might now want to pick up actual novels and not just a pulp bestseller. Um, so I at least would agree with that. that I think for me that voluminous reading inside a genre was key. Uh, I, I could still read what was assigned in school, and I at least learned from my teachers and professors that those books were uh, better in some difficult to describe measure of taste. 
but they weren't what I love. But as I've gotten older, the, the loves have pivoted in terms of I, I love the more complex reading now. Uh, I wonder, could you speak to uh, maybe what are, I know you mentioned, um, you mentioned phones. Are there other things that you would look at as like, what have we replaced that leisure reading with? I mean, I've, I assume children are the same. Uh, they still have curiosity. They still have desires. But instead, those things are being directed elsewhere instead of leisure reading. Where, where do you see that going today? I think it's going and going and going. And it's getting more sophisticated all the time, the video games and the, and the social media. And what we need to remember is, and I wrote about this in the, in the recent book, when Silicon Valley designed these tools and websites, they hired psychologists who are experts in addiction. You know, sometimes it's called persuasive design. That is, you design a website that is going to draw eyes and hold them there. And it's going to, you know, persuasion is bringing them in, getting them involved, and actually activating, you know, in the brain, some of those same centers that drugs activate. And the idea is to get them hooked, get them on the video game, get them on the, on the website so that they don't want to leave and that they go into something called slow time, the term slow time. Slow time is when you get in front of a video game and you play it for three hours. And when you get up, you think you've been sitting there for 45 minutes. You know, time just flows and it seems like it's not, it's not that long. That's ideal because again, the longer the eyes are on these games, the more usage is made of them, the more money the Silicon Valley people make. And by the way, they don't let their own kids do these games. I mean, Steve Jobs famously kept screens away from his kids at home. They, the, the schools in Silicon Valley with the wealthier are ones like the Waldorf schools, which have no technology. And they, they know what the screens do to kids. They design them that way. They keep their own kids away from them. And as I see it, it's just going to get more sophisticated. I mean, we, we've we got more parents aware of the screen addiction problems. They're fighting against this. They're putting their kids in schools, you know, classical education schools, which tend to be lower tech than public schools. Now, politicians do public schools, they love technology. It looks like an easy way to support, to, to say, I believe in education. Um, but the, uh, uh, the industry is multi-billion dollar industry that parents are struggling to resist. They, we have to understand that, you know, that this is doing Satan's work. All right. On, on planet Earth. Now, it's a demon. It's the enemy. And they have to take an adversarial position on this. And that forces them into many liberal parents see this happening and it pushes them into an uncomfortable position hmm. because a liberal is supposed to be in favor of progress a liberal believes that things can get better with new innovation. They don't want to sound like they are reactionaries. They don't want to be resistant to the general trend of history. And they, they feel uncomfortable attacking the kids for their habits. No, live and let live. It's just a neutral tool. It's what people do with it. That's that's what really what really matters. The, the libertarian idea of we're all these super independent, rational choice making creatures. Well, this actually runs against the main currents of liberal and leftist thought for for quite a long time, which says that something like this <clears throat> that has been manufactured invented, produced by corporations, global systems, marketed by advertisers who are out to manipulate people to make money off of them. To say that this is a neutral tool 
Hmm. Lies. Everything liberals believe about the social manipulation mm -hmm. going on by big corporations. And it is, it is strangely innocent or naive to, to think that we all have that capacity for being unaffected, uninfluenced. I'm back here. I can choose this or this or this. And what is the liberal position? I should have total freedom to do so. Well, you don't. You live in the world. You're being acted upon all the time by forces and influences. And what you need are counter forces and influences, such as the Sermon on the Mount, uh, to help you recognize and fend off bad influences. And the kids can't do that on their own. They live in a, uh, they're, they're in a tidal wave of social media, of TikTok, of the videos, of stimulation. They soak up stupid movies. My goodness, I see 35-year-old men on, on, on airplanes watching Marvel superhero movies, and I'm embarrassed for them. What are you doing watching something for 13-year-olds? And But this is the world that this, this is the, the, the consumer society, the media saturation, and the hyper-stimulation that 13, 14, and 15-year-olds are, are living within. And they're not good intellectual habits. They're mm. not producing a better vocabulary. They're not planting historical knowledge in their heads. They aren't acquiring the tools, the equipment, the, the great ideas, the great creations of beauty that would give them standards by which to judge all this present junk flowing into their heads. And see, I, I, I think the genre fiction that you read, that is great. All right. Reading, you know, crime stories, mm -hmm. reading biographies of sports heroes and, and musicians or anything with that book. It's so important. It's silent. It takes uninterrupted linear concentration for 10, 20, 30 minutes at a time. This is actually a crucial habit for success later on in life. Now, what I, what I argue in the current book is that uh, millennials are now in their 30s, late 20s, 30s, up to 40 years old now. And they're in a sour mood. They're not happy. They, they don't particularly like their country. Less than 50% of them call themselves patriots. They don't have church. You know, they, they don't, they don't go to church very much. They don't have God, no transcendent orientation. They don't live in sort of reliable, familiar neighborhoods, right? They bounce around a lot. They, they don't have jobs where they see long-term planning taking place. They jump around a lot. And the economy has forced this on them in, in many ways. And they mistrust their fellow Americans. Social mistrust, as it's called, is high among millennials. They're not getting married and forming families at nearly the rate older generations did. We've actually got a serious birth mm -hmm. problem now in the United States. Yeah. One third of millennial men will not have been married by age 40. That's a huge amount. Uh, I, put, I wrote about this in, in, in the book. And that's a sign of sort of pessimism or groundlessness, the inability to see a positive future and build something. And they don't, here's the, here's the problem. They didn't get in those teenage years, the equipment to handle adult difficulties. They don't have great stories of love, honor, betrayal, passion, loyalty, sacrifice in their heads. 
They don't have, as I said, any religious formation that would teach them how to handle disappointment. Hmm. Right? The, the disappointment. You, you know, right? Try reading the book of Job. How's that? For disappointment. Try, try, try go watch Death of a Salesman. Disappointment in Middle Age. Okay. These are the, the love, great love stories and, and, and rejection of Dido and Calypso and 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 the, these stories. It would just give them a background of meaning, right? It, it would let them place the things that happen in their daily lives at age 30 into a, into a context that would manage them a little better. They didn't get that. And so a lot of them go for the, and wh where do they go instead for meaning? Oh, racial justice and, a climate and and various utopian fantasies, and, and a utopian fantasy is a dangerous fantasy, as as we know. But they don't, they don't know that. They haven't read George Orwell. You know, they're they're willing to cancel people for mm -hmm. saying something politically incorrect. They don't know what, what happens when you start putting people in jail for speech, creating hate speech laws, destroying their lives. They, they don't they don't know any sense of the history of those experiments. They don't appreciate the miracle of pluralism. It really is a miracle that we ever created a society where people can mingle and believe very different things about fundamental realities. That's that's pretty extraordinary that that ever happened. That's one thing that, you know, 17th century liberalism, 18th century liberalism, the Enlightenment gave us mm -hmm. the capacity to, to mingle, to have a pluralistic society. Well, they they don't, you know, that's what the First Amendment is about. Now, why should I have to listen to someone say something that I think is sexist? Mm -hmm. Shut up. You ought to be shut up. In fact, you ought to be removed from your job. So I'm going to sign a petition with 3,000 others mm. to get you fired. But that, that they, Josh, they feel very good about doing that. They're not embarrassed about that. They feel noble. This is virtue signaling with real consequences. And they feel the virtue. Again, because mm. they didn't learn any lessons that they were supposed to learn. In, in, in school and in, in the culture in in their teenage worlds. So what I'm hearing in a lot of all of this, I mean, I guess are, are a lot, there's a, I've been making notes and all that. There's a lot I want to follow up on, but we don't have time to do that. Um, but the, the heart of this seems to be that, that really education really does matter. And that in a very fundamental way, um, American culture has sort of gotten education wrong for a long time. And that that getting education wrong for a long time, coinciding with massive leaps in, techn in technology and the ability to shape people's orientations and the loves of the heart and to distract them has really robbed students of the, the necessary tools to withstand life's hardships and to find joy and happiness and meaning in the world. So instead we have people looking for false sources of joy and happiness and meaning. Is that is that a fair? That, that's very good. Yes, yes. And uh, think, you know, one of the things I did in, in the latest book is I, I, was, I was at Stanford and I go down into the archives and I asked the librarians to pull old catalogs from Stanford from the 1950s and 60s. And I looked at the general education requirements in 1959, you know, the year I was born. And the general education requirements at Stanford, and Stanford was on the quarter system, just like UCLA, where I went. Uh, the quarter system is you got three terms a year. What Stanford required was a full year of Western civilization, mm -hmm. a full year, three courses in Western civilization, a full year in English writing and literature. Mm -hmm. And part of the literature part uh, component was we're going to expose you to the greatest writing in the history of the English language. So even if they're not using the term great books, it's still that sort of that sort of approach was was what they were going with. Josh, when when the history department described they handled the Western Civ sequence, 
-hmm. The history department described it in triumphal terms, Mm -hmm. saying this is the legacy of a great civilization. These are great works, uh, literature, art, music, great events, great leaders, and you are coming here to Stanford first year. We are immersing you in a grand, magnificent Hmm. inheritance. Now think about students coming 19 years old. I'm coming to Stanford and I am going to be handed the greatest geniuses, Michelangelo, Shakespeare, Virgil. This is, these, these are the masterpieces of human thought and creation. And I get it. And it, it had scope, right? It was a lineage, a heritage. It wasn't just random this and this and this. It was a big story, capital B, capital S. And it flattered the young. You're coming into the world and the world offers you a great story. Now, there's something we know what happened. I mean, there's also something profoundly democratic in that as well, in that uh, you don't have to be American, African, British, French, Canadian, whatever, rich or poor, young or old. Any student coming into that classroom, this is your inheritance as a human being. This and is it's, for it's, you, right? Yeah. The world is for you. You know, I, 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 Hannah Arendt wrote an, an important article about education in the 1950s, and I quoted from it, and her saying that these, so many of these educators now, progressivist educators, they don't like this idea of handing the young a world, mm. putting them in the shadow of the greats. No, 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 no. We're going to go for skills and problem solving. We want you to become critical thinkers. And we're not going to impose upon you the past. Well, Hannah Arendt said this idea was passed off as a form of liberation, Mm -hmm. letting the kids take ownership of their own learning. And Hannah Arendt said, what an awful thing to do to young people, to put them out in the world and say, we have nothing to push. We don't represent anything. We're like, we're almost almost like waiters, you know, handing you a menu. Would you like this? And I just bring it to you. Uh, Aran said, you're on your, what we're saying is we're not responsible. You're on your own. Well, that attitude certainly spread. And we added to that the political attack on Western civilization. So we destroyed it. And what do students coming to college now see? Not Hillsdale. You guys have held the line. Uh, What do they see when they go to college, when they look at the general education requirements? The things all colleges say, I must learn in order to become an educated, discerning, tasteful citizen. Nothing. It's just a grab bag, you know, a diversity course requirement. Oh, what, 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 what silliness. How, how uninspiring that is to the average 18-year-old. Diversity requirement? Wait a minute. No Hamlet? Really? No, no Macbeth? Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow? I don't get the great stuff? Well, maybe you do if you want to do this instead. That's up to you. How dispiriting it is. And I see the young rushing toward, you know, Antifa or, you know, racial justice and and so on, or hating Donald Trump. That's a reaction Hmm. to the elders who failed them when they were teenagers. That is their anger at authorities who didn't act like good authorities when they were young. They Mm -hmm. feel we got no guidance. We were on our own. We had to compete to get into college, to compete for jobs, to compete for internships. And what 
did you represent to us? Nothing. You stand for nothing. You pass along nothing. You have no convictions. You can't, we don't, you don't even give us something meaningful against which to rebel. You're, you, you, you people are wet noodles, spineless. My goodness, no matter, no, no wonder that black students march on the president's office angry at him mm-hmm. because you, you know, you're, you're so, you're so weak, right? I mean, you're not even looking at us as human beings here. You know, maybe you should get mad at us a little bit. At least we would feel like we're fully human beings when you do that. Mm-hmm. That I'm significant. I'm not just, uh, you know, an image to you, uh, uh, you know, an icon of, of, of some kind. You're not giving me any reality here. So uh, this is, I think, what what the colleges have done is it's a, it's a crisis of confidence of their own authority. And you've got a lot of timid, weak people Mm. now running colleges who are acting more like small time politicians than as genuine educators. You're reminding me of uh, different philosophy professors along the way who I've heard make arguments about um, as, as human beings, we are meaning seeking and storytelling creatures. And so in the absence of a substantive story or real meaning to find, we replace that with either a, with a bad story or, or false meaning. And so it, it seems on the one hand, I just find it really interesting that even though your title sound, the titles of your book sound like they indict the dumbest generation, uh, they're, they're really, they're not so much an indictment of that generation as they are the indictment of the previous perhaps two or three generations of curators of this tradition who exactly. should be sending something substantive to the next generation and instead really abdicated that responsibility. Well, um, Mark, do you see any hope for the present? Does your, does your book end on a, a pessimistic note of despair? Or uh, do you see places where that, that substantive encounter with meaning still survives or, or where we can turn to for better options than continuing uh, the, the awful distraction that is TikTok? What, what are your thoughts as far as like something different for the future? Josh, it's all over. That there's no hope, Josh. It's done. I mean, look, we we had we had you know 20, 2,300 years of the life of the mind, the disinterested pursuit of truth and beauty. In some pockets, it it survived. That's not too bad, is it? I mean, you know the the the, the new the the, dark, the the new dark age is upon us. It's a dark age in that it's so filled with so much, so much noise and so much light, not illumination, just just flickering lights, off and on. The I don't, I don't think there's really any going back into into a book a bookish society. Um, I I I would say that technology is going to advance farther and farther. We'll have artificial intelligence doing so much for us that we don't have to do for ourselves more and more. And the best one can do is realize, you know, parents here or young people realize that while the world is spinning down, uh, you still can form a very good life for yourself and for your family in, in this regard know that if you read a lot of books, life is better for you. You can compete better. You are able to filter out nonsense, stupidity better. You are able to raise your, ch- your children in a, in a way that will lead to fewer symptoms in your children from the sick society that we ha- inhabit. And people will recognize that. They'll see you as, again, uh, an astute human being, knowledgeable and informed. You will speak in a way that doesn't insert a like into every sentence. 
uh, you will uh, find sources of joy in works of beauty and intelligence that are not accessible to other people because they haven't been exposed to them. You'll have a better life. You can do this. And, and that the world still appreciates the mm -hmm. knowledge and talent that come with a reading life. The world does appreciate this. Offices need people who know how to write clear sentences, right? Science, medicine need good communicators. Uh, they, uh, the media need people who are able to speak and write intelligently. They still do. The number of people who can do that is diminishing. You know, when we were at the, the, the conservative meeting in Miami, you heard Peter Thiel at the opening, a uh, very interesting lecture. He always comes at issues in, in a sideways fashion that throws an interesting light on, on, on things. He talked about, we got to get more young people into STEM. Josh, I don't think we can get more young people I, into STEM. I mean, I'm personally a little worried that we've been saying that now for at least 10 years that I've been paying attention. And I'm pretty sure that 20 years from now, we will have flooded STEM fields like we've currently flooded academia uh, and the humanities fields with PhDs. Because uh, 20 to 30 years ago, you actually could reasonably count on getting a PhD in history or literature or philosophy and finding a job doing that. Today, we've we've got yeah. it, it took so long to change the societal messaging. I, I'm worried the same thing will happen with STEM. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not convinced we need more STEM people. I think we have a, I agree with most of what you're saying, but I think I'm a bit more optimistic than you are, but I think <laughs> we have a dearth of people who have values and actually understand that values fit inside of a general metaphysical framework that is, a, is connected to the transcendent. And without the transcendent, you don't really have a good reason to be a good person. Uh, we, 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 we lack people who have those and who can articulate that, which has nothing to do with science, technology, uh, engineering, or math, really. Josh, you, you've got to be more optimistic than I am. I'm, I'm, I, I can afford to be. I'm, I'm old. So oh, well. you, I mean, you, I, but you, what I mean by that, uh, as you were describing that, I was thinking of, uh, I, I assume you know the, the novel A Canticle for Leibowitz. You know, people keep telling me, you got to read this, you got to read this. I've never gotten around what? to reading this. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if you know uh, Brad Berzer at, at Hillsdale College, but – uh, he he sold me on a canticle for Leibowitz, goodness, 15 years ago now, and yeah. uh, that's one I've gone back to a few different times. Um, it is a fabulous. It's a dystopian future tale of a collapsed society, but it, you start in somewhere like the year 2600 or so with a new dark ages, and there's a monastery that has preserved the ancient knowledge. The ancient knowledge in this case is a a uh, diagram of a broken electrical circuit by a guy named Leibowitz. Hmm. And the novel's made up of three short novellas that each are separated by a couple hundred years. And you you get all the way through and like this preservation of some knowledge eventually leads to the reconstruction of a whole way of life. And just as the world is about to destroy itself again in a nuclear holocaust, uh, the last survivors of the Leibowitz monastery by now they've canonized Saint Leibowitz the electrician. It's it's, it's hmm. and uh, but they they take off for a new planet to to carry their civilization onward one step further, and I I think that's if we're um, I I I keep I'm listening for ways to disagree with your analysis. I don't have any um, except that I do think there are if there's room for hope, it's it's not necessarily hope for the entirety of an American culture per se. But it is hope for individuals, for families, for small communities that unite around sources of truth and, and decide to live together in, in consonance with that truth. Um, I'm thinking particularly there of, uh, uh, I think the classical renewal movement has led to thousands of schools that are made up of hundreds of families that are all trying to do just that. They're trying to recover those things that seemingly have been lost. And... In as much as we can do that, and there's even um, 
there's even a it's it's still a small handful, but there's still a smattering of new colleges, Thales College being the newest of them, uh, up there with uh, New College Franklin or uh, New St. Andrews College in Idaho that are trying to create new avenues for that substantive collegiate formation. Yeah. Um, all of those are, they're small, uh, but they're the, um, I don't know, maybe uh, maybe to wax a little bit biblical, it's the, uh, it's the still small voice rather than the whirling hurricane of a storm. Well, yeah. we might wish for a storm to be encompass all of society, but that's not what's happening. It's this, it's small, it's quiet. Um, maybe to do an even worse abuse to a, a new Testament metaphor. It's like a, uh, if the kingdom of heaven is like a, is a, like yeast working its way throughout the whole loaf, uh, maybe classical education is sort of the, the yeast of the old tradition working its way into modernity. What are your thoughts on, on all of that? It's certainly exploding. You know, it's, well, it's operating on a, on, a, on a small base, but it is growing every single year. And it's a sign of more and more parents and, and students actually realizing this stuff over here, it's not good. It's not helping. It's not fulfilling my, my hunger. And so they are going into classical schools. They're expanding all the time. More are opening every month, it seems, a new classical school is opening and that that's that's a genuine sign of optimism yes uh people pulling their kids out of the public schools and either homeschooling them or going to the classical schools and the homeschooling generally leans more toward a classical uh, uh orientation and and so we'll see we'll see josh i mean uh you know, no matter what way the world is going, you still have to hold the line as best you can. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm pessimistic, but you know, I'm 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 writing things all the time. I'm visiting, speaking at classical schools uh, to talk about this is great. This is where it's happening. You know the the academic humanities in you know mainstream the college campus those are those are done those are those are over, and students of course are leaving those mm -hmm. majors. They have voted with their feet against English and history and and the the, the languages, uh, and that means that there's a there's an opening for places like. Hillsdale and Thomas Aquinas College and then, you know, the, the others you mentioned. Hillsdale has actually become, the, I mean, the applications to Hillsdale, uh, Hillsdale Prof told me this the other day, they are shooting way up. Hillsdale is getting, I, I think it's under 20% selectivity rate. I think they, the selectivity is in about 15, 16%. Yeah. That's getting close to some of the lower Ivy League schools so uh uh let's get more colleges like hillsdale out there let's uh let's provide that that alternative and see what the numbers are i really i believe in numbers you know i i, I think that when you got a sign of demand that's a that's a good thing that's a good thing and the classical schools have have got it and one and, and they they've got it because not any theory not anything about students it's about the content mm -hmm. right here we're going to read in this school we're going to do a little latin we're going to teach dante mm -hmm. we're going to listen to some mozart and we're going to study the magna carta mm -hmm. it, it's about the content the material uh, which is not what you're going to hear a lot about in ed schools. I think it's 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 very true, uh, and that honestly that is one of the the biggest struggles we have in in recruiting teachers. Uh, and and then we tend to have teachers of two categories: either folks come to Thales Academy either uh, deeply versed in a content area, but not having any of the skills that you pick up in an education program. Things yeah. like classroom management and how to write an email uh, really clearly, how to structure a lesson, uh, some basic psycho some basic psychology for different age ranges and so on. 
Um, or we have folks who come with all of those things, but they don't actually know anything about the content area. And uh, it's not universally true. Nine times out of 10, we can work with people a lot more easily if they have the content already, if they know right. history or literature or their language uh, or math right. or science or arts or music, whatever it is. Um, we can work with them to help them with the, they'll have a first semester crash course education class, basically. And, and just through teaching and through their mentor, their department chair, their principal, all of these folks are helping them get those pieces underneath them. Man, we can, it is really hard to work with, <laughs> to ask folks to basically pick up a second specialty um, at night by just reading two or three books a week to learn the material while right. they're working a full-time job. I would so much rather have folks who have gotten a really formative encounter in some substantive content area uh, and then they come teach and we can help them with the, how do you do this thing called teaching? We can help with that part. Yeah, yeah. We can't be college and have them teach at the same time. Right. I mean, how, mu how much of that, those teaching practicalities uh, come through experience of teaching, mm -hmm. right? You try things. Okay. This didn't work. I screwed that one up. All right. I'm going to adjust, you know, do it, do it this time better. Uh, the, it, it's hard to theorize those, those habits. Uh, in the classroom. So much of it is a, is a judgment call. But yeah, some things like how do you make an assignment, right? How do you, what, what are your grading standards? Things, things like that. That can be taught, right? Pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Relatively so. Yeah. Um, well, Mark, do uh, I, I'm kind of curious. Um, what's the reception been like for, for your re most recent book? I know uh, writing sort of a, a closely tied together sequel separated by a decade. How, how has that gone over as far as receptivity? Have people liked your book? Has it gotten flamed? Has it been well reviewed? What's the well, reception to that? Lots, lots of media, lots of discussion, not as much attention as the first book hmm. got. And I think that's probably because we're, we're in a different environment now. People are so absorbed in the political scene. Hmm. And you know, the Democrats, the Republicans, the pan, the, the lockdown, the, the, the midterm elections coming up. I mean, we really have entered, the country has entered into a condition of genuine political obsession. You know, how much national attention goes to the arts, to literature to cultural matters. I mean, everything is so intensely political. The identity politics are just deranged in terms of what the news pays attention to, what, what social media focuses upon, you know, it wasn't that long ago that a novel could actually be a national event in that it was something everyone needed to have an opinion on. Everyone in intellectual circles and in, in cultural circles had to have an opinion on. When was the last time a novel struck a national chord? I, I, I've written a little bit about this. I would say it was... I mean, some people say it was Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities. That's who I had in mind. <laughs> that, 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 was, that was a huge cultural representation about America in a certain way. And everyone, everyone was talking about that. A few years later, we had Douglas Copeland's novel, Generation X. Hmm. That certainly captured uh, a mood for, for a generation. After that, you know, any is there any novelist who is a major cultural force, cultural force, in the way, say, in the 1960s, John Updike. John Updike was a real voice of a certain suburban middle class world that was America. That, that, that represented an important part of America in sort of the national, the national dialogue about things. Tom Wolfe 
was a representation of a, an important part of America. Anyone now? I mean, there are figures like Toni Morrison or the lady I'm thinking of who wrote Gilead. I can't remember her name. Um, Salman Rushdie was making splashes a couple weeks ago when he got shot. Like yeah. that was that's more about him as an author than it is. I mean, I, I I'm pretty sure most of the people who talk about Salman Rushdie have not actually read the Satanic Verses. So yeah, uh, I picked that one up years ago just because I wanted to be able to make reference to it intelligently, and that meant I had to have read it. And it was not nearly as divisive as I expected it to be. Like, I figured he would just like rake Islam over the coals, and it's it's not that. It's something yeah. different. Yeah. But but I think you're right about the there. There's not a. I was thinking about that in terms of, um, particular in terms of uh, that we don't have that in music. I don't know of any huge culture straddling uh, current musicians. Um, Hans Zimmer soundtracks, but those are so pop and uh, made into movie soundtracks that they. It's hard to differ differentiate pop culture and high culture. Um, yeah, I, I I don't know of anybody who who kind of stands at that pinnacle spot. Yeah, I mean the 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 ma who are the major voices of culture in in America today? I mean, is it is it Mark Zuckerberg? You know, is it is it? Uh, I, I I mean this this is in a way this is the the outcome of multiculturalism simply to break culture up so much, there is no national culture anymore. There are no national cultural voices or figures or traditions. No, they don't. And, and, and that was the goal. That was the goal of the left, to disintegrate American life. Hmm. And they did it. They did it, Josh. I, I can't mention a book in a, a class at Emory University that every student has read. I could do that 25 years ago. Sure. Nearly everyone will will have read Huck Finn. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the popular books were you know, To Kill a Mockingbird and Huck Finn. Scar it used to be Scarlet Letter, everyone read that. Uh, but now, eh, there's nothing, there's nothing. And I, I think Toni Morrison actually is is dimming her, her, her I think her, her reputation is is going is is becoming less. So I think as time goes by, her works will appear a little more dated. But we'll see. And I this this may just be my own lack of ability to read more contemporary stuff in that vein. But I tried to read Toni Morrison just because people I respect respect keep mentioning her, and I could not figure out what was going on. Um, yeah, Cormac McCarthy is another contemporary who made a lot. He at least made more sense to me than Toni Morrison did. Yeah, yeah, the road is uh, that's a strong one. Oh, I like the road a lot. Ooh, uh, Mark, cool. what are you what are you reading right now? I know you're always reading uh, in part for your podcast, but I assume also for your own pleasure. What what are you reading these days? Well, for the podcast, it's focused on books, so I go through a lot of books for for uh, for that, but. You know, I will go back and read things like, you know, the crime novels of Georges Simenon, you know, mm -hmm. the, the French profile of the French, uh, the Paris inspector who was inspecting crimes, uh, Maclay. Uh, so I'll, that, that kind of genre fiction, mm -hmm. yeah, I will, I'll go through that. I will, you know, I'll, I'll read some of the old sort of hard-boiled detective stuff. Uh, by you know Ross McDonald or or John B McDonald hmm. uh, if if those names uh, mean anything to me but I like to relax at night with a book that uh, usually fiction mm -hmm. that is uh, sort of old fashioned old fashioned genre stuff fantastic yeah. Uh well, Mark, I know I listen to your show pretty regularly. Uh, I'd love if you could tell us a bit about uh, your First Things podcast, how you got into it, and uh, anything you want to say to uh, plug your show. Well, I came into First Things in 2014 as an as senior editor, sort of number two after after Rusty Reno, and it was all editing. But you know, the years go by. 2017, 2018, people are starting to do video and stuff on the website. We're trying to build up. And I just started doing some of these podcasts, got rid of the video as a pain. 
<laughs> and uh, and then I thought, you know, let's just make it about books. Uh, a lot of the the big podcasts about politics and, and current affairs and people talking, I wanted to really uphold the book culture and highlighting books that aren't, you know, the big name ones, but are about issues important to first things readers. So a lot about religion and culture and history mm -hmm. and, and some politics, you know, Supreme Court cases uh, affecting uh, religious faith. So started doing it and, you know, it, it's pretty popular now. Sometimes we break 20,000 uh, downloads for episodes. I'm happy. I'm happy with that. It also keeps you fresh. You know, you, 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 you know, right. Having to interview someone, you, you got to bone up on things and you got to stay current. You, you, you learn new things. You have discussions. You listen to people talk. All I do on the podcast is ask some leading questions and get out of the way. Yep. You know, let the author, I say, it's your show. You got a half an hour. It's your book. You know, <laughs> well, let, let's talk about it. And that, so that's my job. Uh, love it. I think uh, one of my favorite parts about getting into podcasting has been it's a great way to meet really interesting people and uh, just a way to keep up those connections over the years. Um, well, Mark, where can people find and follow your work online if they want to know more about what you do? Well, you know, I, I do the, the the stupid Twitter thing, you know, using it mostly not to argue or insult, but to pass on information, you know, things that have been published, the podcast uh reminders about some historical facts when people say things <laughs> that are erroneous say not no no that's not quite what happened but trying to do it in a you know in a in a in a in an academic way let's put it put it that way uh but you know the book uh the book is on Amazon it's it's got a nice discount rate of $21 and I actually invite parents to write to me hmm. if they have questions about their kid's education, the college application process, and I respond. I respond to people if they if they write to me and my, you know, my first things address is mbauerline at firstthings.com. And I'm happy to talk to people about about their their children's educational future. Oh, fantastic. And uh just in case any listeners have not figured this out by now, I'm also a fan of uh, the, the First Things podcast, which you can find anywhere you listen to podcasts. If you search for First Things podcast, uh, Mark's show will come up. Uh, and it, he does really good interviews that are exactly as he described. Um, uh, I think uh, your show is one of my influences, at least, but also alongside, uh, I don't know if you know the, the Christian Humanist podcast guys. Uh, they're a trio of... Uh, one guy is still an English professor. The other two have since moved from the professorship down to the K-12 world, but they all started conversing with each other over a podcast to stay in touch. And the the conversationality of, of your show and of their show both helped me with thinking through what I what I wanted podcasting to, to look like. Very uh, so good. If you enjoyed this at all, uh, do be sure to uh, uh, follow Mark's show as well. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This has been great. Thank you. I enjoyed it, Josh, and we'll be in touch. All right. And thank you, listeners, for joining us today for another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon. My guest this episode has been Dr. Mark Bauerlein, Professor Emeritus at Emory University, author of The Dumbest Generation and The Dumbest Generation Grows Up. He's also the regular host of the First Things podcast. If you like this episode, please leave us a five-star review and share it with your friends. Until next time, seek the good, discover the true, and love the beautiful. You've been listening to another episode of The Optimistic Curmudgeon, where the best ideas win. I'm your host, Josh Herring. The Optimistic Curmudgeon is a project of Thales Press. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star review and share it with your friends. You can find us on three major social media platforms. Search for The Optimistic Curmudgeon on Facebook and LinkedIn, and find us on Twitter at the handle at the Optimistic C3. This episode was edited and produced by Madison K, audio engineer for The Optimistic Curmudgeon. Until next time, seek the good, pursue the true, and love the beautiful.